promotions got about 50 fit, 50. About two thirds came from the U.S. with the United Kingdom, uh, which aired the pregame show for ITV4, being the strong second, followed by Australia, Germany, and Canada. So this was a worldwide phenomenon. Meltzer predicted that further replay buys of Double or Nothing would easily result in overtaking ECW's biggest show ever, 99,000, and becoming the biggest pay-per-view in pro wrestling history that wasn't produced by WWE or WCW, and he was correct. That did happen. Meltzer additionally described that no one has achieved this level of buys without regular television exposure since the 2002 Tito Ortiz versus Ken Shamrock match and the 2004 Chuck Liddell versus Ortiz fights. Both of them, by the way, were UFC mixed martial arts fights, not Mm. pro wrestling fights. On the June 10th edition, Meltzer wrote that Double or Nothing is estimated at somewhere between 98.5, well, at 98,500 and 113,000 buys, somewhere in between there, even at its lowest end, 98,005. Huge, huge. The best estimate has the U.S. pay-per-view buys around 71,000, which almost an exact 50-50 split, as we mentioned before, from television and the Bleacher Report Live. Now, that is notable because nobody ever did a 50-50 split at the beginning. The biggest split that Meltzer had heard of for a television pay-per-view and streaming was Conor McGregor versus Khabib Nurmagomedov. He's not a wrestler. I don't have to get it right. And that was an 80-20 split in favor of the television. Now, he is wrong there. I know that WCW would get 50-50 split for their pay-per-views. And WWE, I have heard, also got um, more. Like, they'd get a 60-40 on their end. But I I know for sure the WCW one is because all of their numbers had to be um, public when the whole uh, bankruptcy lawsuit happened. So... WCW did have 50-50 splits, but WCW had the lineage of the NWA and then literally had like 90, 91. So they probably had five years of buildup before they got to that moment. Yeah. So huge. I mean, just, just huge. Just want to call the facts the facts. The card for that show pasty featured a new crop of talent in this ever growing market. We had the Casino Battle Royal. I'm not going to name everybody who was on that here. Let's just say that uh, a no-legged wrestler and the uh, 400, 500-pound AC Romero were featured in that. Yes, they were. Um, that was won by Hangman Adam Page. Kip Sabian def- defeating Sammy Guevara. SCU, Daniels, Kazarian, and Scorpio Sky besting Nishima, T-Hawk, and Lindemann of OWE. Wow, they were going to be a big thing and nothing ever happened there. Yeah, no, that was, that was really, it was like a two-off and it was done. And that was just for Shima. Yeah. Britt Baker winning over Kylie Ray, Nyla Rose, and Awesome Kong. The Best Friends defeating Anahediko and Jack Evans. Hakiru Shida, Ryo Abe, and Ryo Mizunami topped Aja Kong, Yuka Sakazaki, and Emi Sukaru. Cody took out Dustin Rhodes, AAA World Tag Team Champions, Young Bucks beating the Lucha Brothers, and the main event of the night scene, Chris Jericho defeating Kenny Omega. It was a hell of a card. Hell of a card. It was. Oh, man. That Cody-Dustin match is still a beautiful work of art in the world of wrestling. And you know, take take away all the crazy shit that's happened in 2020. Without even without that, it's just amazing that that that's only been a year ago. I know it feels like so much longer. <laughs> I was sitting here, uh, I was sitting here thinking the other day. I was I was actually going over stuff in my head about pro wrestling and the show and this and that. And AEW only had about, I think, less than six months of television before all of this COVID stuff hit and kind of shut them down. Like. They're still, their show is still a brand new product right now. They've got less than a year of what I would call a real show. I think WWE, AEW, Impact Wrestling, ML, everybody will tell you that ever since the COVID stuff hit, this isn't, 
this isn't canon. What's happening? What's happening right now? To put it in like comic book terms, I don't yeah. know a better way to put it. Like three, five years from now, they're not going to be showing highlights of the shit that's happening right now with empty arenas and like like this is just filler until they get back to real programming. Well, I mean, once this all goes down in history and becomes history, then they're going to embrace it more. I don't yeah, think so. I, I think this is going to be a dark age that they don't talk about very often. <laughs> I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to show, you know, you're going to have a, a best of compilation and you're going to show a match between two wrestlers in front of nobody. Like that's never going to happen. That's not going to be on any compilation DVD or nothing. I can't imagine. Uh, maybe the a best of. Not a, not a compilation. Maybe a documentary about this event. Yeah. Or, I mean, yeah. About the yeah. event or about the series of events, you know, because it's honestly for how hard they've been pushing through this, they're staying successful, which is great for a brand new company. I think that's that's historic to them. Yeah. So I think yeah, that's but I'm just want to embrace. Well, for real, that's kind of what I'm saying is well that I mean they've only had like six months of real television and yeah. then they've had this this shit. <laughs> You know, that's just that nobody, nobody planned for. Nobody, nobody scripted this. When they sat down and penned their, you know, this is where we want to. Yeah, <laughs> this is general. <laughs> when they sat down and penned what they wanted to do for their first year, I can guarantee you nothing that's happened in the past three, four months was on that list. Nothing. Whew. Uh, well, we've been lightening the mood a little bit. I think it's time to crack it in to another gear with this week's uh, Tilkin J.R.R. Well, let me tell you something, brother. How about you make me a bad guy transvestite with a couple bolts in my neck, and I'll spermonate you, brother. I can do it all. You name it, brother. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about right there. Yeah. Thinking, thinking, thinking. <laughs> I'm thinking yeah. I want to be a transvestite, brother. Yeah. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. But Put one some bolt somewhere. <laughs> I don't want to tell you what's 24 inches, brother, but it's the thermos. <laughs> <laughs> I listened to that before the show, and I can't not crack up when he transfers between Hogan and Macho Man. Right. <laughs> I just love when he's like, you're going to put some bolts somewhere, brother. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. It's good stuff. It's it's good stuff. It's actually great it's if you know where it's coming from. But it's good to laugh right now. It is. It's it's very good to laugh. And uh, speaking of things that might make you laugh, let's get into 2020's AEW Double or Nothing. Yes. Didn't turn into the buy-in. But we had you didn't number turn one. into it? I didn't turn into it. And I didn't That's turn amazing. into it either. <laughs> We had the number one contender match for the tag team titles, seeing the best friends Chuck Taylor and Trent defeating the private parties Isaiah Cassidy and Mark Quinn. Chuck Taylor should just drop the Taylor name at this point. They should just be Chuck and Trent. I think, I think Chuck. I think Chuck Taylor should just drop Trent. <laughs> <laughs> That's just that's just Fat Max, bro. I, no. I, mean, I know you don't like them, but you can't say they haven't been getting better. Oh no, no, they they work well together. Trent is always best when he's with Chuck Taylor. I mean, to me, Trent needs Chuck, and I think and I think Chuck is held back by Trent. But I I get it. They have fun together. When you're in a tag team, you don't work as hard. You you have a travel buddy that you're always with, so you can organize things so much better. They seem to genuinely enjoy each other, so I mean, I get it. It's fine. And obviously, they're called best friends because eventually they're gonna split, and it's gonna be huge. You know. You know. Yeah, I, I hope so. I hope so. But I've, I mean, I've always just not been a big Trent Breda fan. Go back to some of our earlier shows when he's working We're New Japan or ROH, nice. and it's just like I'm just. I'm not a Trent Breda guy. I'm just not. He's just never won me over, and maybe he just never will. And there might not be a reason for it. But I feel he's just, yeah, that's just, I didn't watch the match either, so I'm not saying he did bad in the match. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm, just I'm also saying that I, I still think, um, I still think Private Party should have went over, even if it is a uh, 
buy-in or pre-show or whatever you want to call it. I just I don't get I don't get the the I know people say people use Barry too much. Private Party just real they might not have been buried, but they sure haven't been pushed. I can say that easily. Yeah. I heard there was some uh, pretty poor rookie spots from Private Party in this match, which might be part of the reason why they're not getting the push that everybody thought they were going to get. Um, uh, could be. But That's kind, that I didn't kinda see happened. it, so I can't really say. Yeah, that kind of happened, though, a lot. I mean, throughout the whole show, there's... That's the thing, when you have a lot of these up-and-comers... Again, as new as this thing is, a lot of these a lot of these people never have done live TV. Well, they've let alone... wrestled in front of nobody before. <laughs> you know, but yeah, so many of these people have never done like live TV. Um, ha- have been put in this position, and they're learning as they go. They obviously none of these people are on. Well, none of the people who are green are put on every single week. So they're not getting as much of the exposure. Uh, so you just they're gonna they're gonna grow as we go, you hope. And um the people that don't start getting better, we can definitely call out. But I, I did see on this pay per view for sure just a lot of things that I thought just look a little sloppy and um but it happens. It's another reason that I'm a hundred percent for and I've said this in other shows pre-taping every show that you put on mm-hmm. yeah mine pre-taping as well. raw smackdown dynamite i mean you can do the the pay-per-views live and that's cool that gives them something special but god there's nothing wrong with pre-taping shit no, there's i not. mean the the sitcom and drama tv community has been doing it for centuries and it Unless seems to work well for them really bad then 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 you might as well just do it live because some and of the editing we've seen has been atrocious. It has been. I And I have a bone to pick about that coming up in the future on this show. So, ooh. <laughs> but we'll move off of that and let's move to the uh, first match of the night, the casino ladder match for the AEW Championship. They – have they done a casino ladder match? I know they no, did the casino. I okay, enjoyed this, though. So I was going to say, this was a little different. This was almost like a Royal Rumble slash Money in the Bank match. Yeah. And it was uh, it was fun. It was fun. I did enjoy it. Um, the results were in almost a 30-minute match, 28 and a half minutes. Brian I Cage defeated Darby Allen. SCU too. That was... Colt Cabana, Orange Cassidy, Joey Janelle, Scorpio Sky, Kip Sabian, Frankie Kazarian, and the Luchosaurus. And yeah, Pacey, you're right. It it started out right off hot with uh, SCU. That was good. Um, it was perfect because last week I asked, I'm like, I hope, I, I hope we see them go against each other. And then it started that way, and I'm like, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, I guess I should bring my notes up because we're actually into the part that I paid attention to. Um. Uh, what I have about this, I think it delivered chaos and spectacle. I super enjoyed this match. I thought it was very fun. And while the high spots and creativity alone were more than enough for me to just love it and have fun with it, they actually wove stories in here yes. throughout and elevated it to another level. That's something you don't get enough from battle royals, I would say, generally. And this was a, like a like a battle royal. You had uh, say you had uh, Saban Havoc and Ford trying to steal the win. You had Orange Cassidy's indifference. You know, right away he's like, "What are the rules?" He asks Excalibur and he tells him, <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, that's stupid." But then slowly, each time he was involved in the match, like he got more into it and he cared a little more, and, and that was cool. He progressed. The introduction of Cage and Taz was done well. Um, I got more on that later, but the, the introduction. Totally, totally right about that that meme where they're they're Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman. <laughs> right. <laughs> so this had tons of stories that actually kept me invested in between the spots, which is what you don't see a lot. You um, Cage's debut, and I, uh, you add him with Lance Archer, Wardlow, and Brody Lee. I can see a real heavyweight division growing here. Super. Yeah quote super heavyweight division i don't know what you want to call it but um big guys are showing up that's what you call it 
Yeah, I have I have some negatives about this, but what what say you on this? I I thought this match was a hell of a lot of fun. A great way to start the show. I was amazed that it was uh, every two minutes somebody comes in that. Really-